Hello. The Virgin Mother of Christ also understood in this vision the future mysteries of the life and death of her sweetest son and of the redemption of the human race, together with those of the new law of the gospel, which was to be established in connection therewith. To her was also manifested other great and profound secrets, which were made known to none other to none other of the saints. The most prudent queen, seeing herself thus in the immediate presence of the deity and furnished with the plenitude of divine gifts and science as become the mother of the word, lost in humility and love, adored the Lord in his infinite essence and without delay also in its union with the most holy humanity. She gave him thanks for having favored her with the dignity of mother of God and for the favors done to the whole human race. She gave thanks and glory also for all the mortals. She offered herself as an acceptable sacrifice in his service, in the rearing up and nourishing of her sweetest son, ready to assist and cooperate as far as on her part it would be possible in the work of the redemption, and the Holy Trinity accepted and appointed her as the cojectrix coject in this sacrament. She asked for new graces and divine light for this purpose and for directing herself in the worthy ministration of her office as mother of the incarnate word, <clears throat> that she might treat him with the veneration and magnanimity due to God himself. She offered to her holiest son all the children of Adam yet to be born and the saints of limbo. And in the name of all and of herself, she performed many acts of heroic virtue and asked for great favors which, however, I will not stop to mention, as I have already done in regard to others on different occasions. For from these it can easily be conjectured what petitions this heavenly queen made on this occasion, which so far excelled all the other fortunate and happy days of her previous life. But she was especially persistent and fervent in her prayer to obtain guidance of the Almighty for the worthy fulfillment of her office as mother of the only begotten of the Father, for this, before all other graces, her humble heart urged her to desire, and this was especially the subject of her solicitude, that she might be guided in all her actions as becomes the mother of God. The Almighty answered her, quote, My dove, do not fear, for I will assist thee and guide thee, directing thee in all things necessary for the service of my only begotten Son, unquote. With this promise she came to herself and issued from her ecstasy, in which all that I have said had happened and which was the most wonderful she ever had. Restored to her faculties, her first action was to prostrate herself on the earth and adore her holiest son, God and man, conceived in her virginal womb. For this she had not yet done with her external and bodily senses and faculties. Nothing that she could do in the service of her Creator did this most prudent mother leave undone. From that time on, she was conscious of feeling new and divine effects in her holiest soul and in her exterior and interior faculties. And although the whole tenor of her life had been most noble, both as regards her body and as her and her both both as regards her body as her soul, yet on this day of the incarnation of the Word, it rose to still greater nobility of spirit and was made more godlike by still higher reaches of grace and indescribable gifts. But let no one think that the purest mother was thus favored and so closely united with the humanity and divinity of her holiest son only in order to continue to enjoy spiritual delights and pleasures free from suffering and pain. Not so. For in closest possible imitation of her sweetest son, this lady lived to share both joy and sorrow with him. The memory of what she had so vividly been taught concerning the labors and the death of her holiest son was like a sword piercing her heart. This sorrow was proportionate to the knowledge and love which such a mother had of such a son, and which his presence and intercourse so continually recalled to her mind. Although the whole life of Christ and of his most holy mother was a continued martyrdom and suffering like that of the cross, and was filled with incessant pain and labors, yet in the most pure and loving heart of, heavenly, of the heavenly queen there was also this special feature of suffering, that to her inward sight as a most loving mother the passion, torments, ignominies, and death of her son were forever present, and by this continued sorrow of thirty-three years she took upon herself the long vigil of our redemption, and during all this time this sacrament was concealed in her bosom without companionship or alleviation from any creatures. With this loving sorrow, full of the sweetest anguish, she often looked upon her holiest son both before and after his birth, and speaking to him from her innermost heart, she would repeat these words, quote, 
Lord and God of my soul, most sweet son of my womb, why hast thou given me the position as mother, and yet connected it with the sorrowful thought of losing thee, leaving me an orphan, bereft of thy desirable company? Scarcely art thou put in possession of a body for thy earthly life, when thou art notified of the sentence of a sorrowful death for the rescue of men. The first of thy actions is one of superabundant merit and satisfaction for his sins. O oh, would that the justice of the Eternal Father were thereby satisfied, and thy sufferings and death fall upon me, for my, from my body and blood thou hast composed thine own, without which it would not be possible for thee to suffer, since thou art the immutable and immortal God. If therefore I have furnished thee the instrument or the matter of thy suffering, let me do, let me too suffer with thee the same death. O oh, inhuman sin, how, being so cruel and the cause of so much evil, couldst thou nevertheless be so fortunate that thy repairer should be one who on account of his infinite goodness can make thee a happy fault o oh, my sweetest son and my love who shall be thy guard and who shall defend thee from thy enemies o oh, would that it were the will of the father that i guard thee and save thee from death or die in thy company and that thou never leave mine but that which happened to the patriarch abraham shall not now take place genesis 22:11 for the predestined decree shall be executed. Let the will of the Lord be fulfilled. Unquote. These loving sighs were many times repeated by our queen, as I shall say further on, and the Eternal Father accepted them as an agreeable sacrifice, while they were the sweetest diversion of her most holy son. Instruction which our queen and lady gave me. My daughter, since thou hast by faith and divine light arrived at a knowledge of the grandeur of God and of his ineffable condescension in coming down from heaven for thee and for all the mortals, let not this benefit be for, for thee idle and fruitless. Adore the essence of God with profound reverence and praise him for what thou knowest of his goodness. Receive not light and grace in vain, Second Corinthians 6, one, and study the encouraging example given by my, my most holy son and myself in imitation of him, as thou hast come to be instructed in it. For as he was true God, and I his mother, for in so far as he was man, his most holy humanity was created. Let us humiliate ourselves in the remembrance of our lowly human nature and confess the greatness of the divinity, greater than any creature can comprehend. Do this especially when thou receivest the same Lord in the holy sacrament. In this admirable sacrament, my most holy Son, with divinity and hum humanity, comes to thee and remains with thee in a new and incomprehensible way. His great condescension is manifest, though it is little taken notice of and respected by mortals, nor does it find the return due to such love. Let then thy acknowledgment be accompanied with as much humility, reverence, and worship as is possible to thy combined powers and faculties. For though they be exerted to the utmost limit, they will always fall short of what thou owest to God and of what he deserves. And in order that thou mayest as far as possible make up for thy deficiencies, offer up that which my most holy Son and I have done. Unite thy spirit and thy affections in union with the church triumphant and militant, offering at the same time thy life as a sacrifice and praying that all nations may know, confess, and adore their true God who became man for all. Thank him for the benefits which he has conferred and confers on all, whether they know him or not, whether they confess or repudiate him. Above all, I ask of thee, my dearest, to do that which is most acceptable to the Lord and most pleasing to me, that thou grieve and in sweet affection mourn over the gross ignorance and dangerous tardiness of the sons of men, over the ingratitude also of the children of the church, who, having received the light of divine faith, yet live in such interior forgetfulness of the works and benefits of the Incarnation, yea, of God himself, and so, so much so that they seem to, to differ from infidels only in some ceremonies in exterior worship. They perform these without spirit or hardiness, many times offending and provoking the divine just, justice which they should placate. Through this ignorance and torpidity it happens that they are not prepared to receive and acquire the true science of the Most High. They bring upon themselves the loss of the divine light, and they deserve to be left in the heavy darkness, making themselves more unworthy than the infidels themselves, and entailing upon themselves an incomparably greater ch chastisement. Mourn over such great damage of thy neighbors, and pray for help from the bottom of thy heart, 
and in order that thou mayest put away from thy own self such formidable dangers, do not undervalue the favors and benefits which thou receivest, nor, even under the pretense of humility, belittle or forget them. Remember and consider how distant was the journey which the grace of the Most High has made in order to call thee. Psalms 18.7 Ponder in thy mind how it was has waited upon thee and consoled thee, assured thee in thy doubts, quieted thee in thy fears, ignored and pardoned thy faults, multiplied favors, caresses, and blessings. I assure thee, my daughter, that thou must confess in thy heart that the Most High has, done, has not done such things with any other generation. Thou of thyself canst do nothing. Thou art poor and more useless than others. Let then thy thanks be greater than that of all the creatures. An explanation of the state in which Most Holy Mary found herself after the incarnation of the Divine Word in her virginal womb. The deeper I begin to understand the divine effects and conditions which were caused by the conception of the Eternal Word in the Queen of Heaven, the more I am involved, the more am I involved in the difficulties of describing this event, for I find myself immersed in exalted and complicated mysteries, while my intellect and my power of expression are entirely insufficient for encompassing what is presented to me. Nevertheless, my soul experiences such great sweetness and such delight in spite of this deficiency that I cannot bring myself to repent entirely of my undertaking. At the same time, obedience animates me and also compels me to overcome the hardships which in a weak and womanly mind would be ins insuperable if the assurance and encouragement coming from this source would not assist me. This is true especially of this chapter, in which I am to treat of the gifts of glory enjoyed by the blessed in heaven. Taking their prerogatives as models, I will try to describe the state of the heavenly Empress Mary after becoming the mother of God. For this purpose, I will speak of the blessed from two points of view, of their own perfection and of their relation to God. As regards the latter, the divinity is made clear and manifest to them with all its perfections and attributes. This is called the object of their beatitude their glory, the substantial joy, the ultimate end, wherein the whole, crea the whole creature finds its adequate end and rest. On the part of the saints there are the beatific operations of vision and love, and of others necessarily connected with that most happy state, which neither the eyes have seen, nor ears have heard, nor can enter into the thoughts of men. Isaiah 64, 4, 1 Corinthians 2, 29. Among the gifts and prerogatives of this glory of the saints, some are called endowments freely given as to a spouse entering upon the spiritual matrimony, which is consummated in the joys of the eternal felicity. Just as the earthly spouse acquires possession and dominion of her endowments and enjoys in common with her husband the use of them, so also in glory these gifts are made to the saints as their own, while their use is co common both to them in as far as they themselves rejoice in them, and to God, in as far as he is glorified in them by the saints. And these ineffable gifts are more or less ex excellent according to the merits and the dignities of each, but they are not given to those who are not of the same nature as the spouse, namely, Christ our Lord, hence only to men, not to angels. For the incarnate word has not entered into any espousals with the angels, Hebrews 2.16, as, as he has done with men, by uniting himself with them in that great sacrament mentioned by the Apostle, Ephesians 5.32, in Christ and the, in the Church. Since, however, the bridegroom Christ as man is composed of body and soul, just like the rest of men, therefore both body and soul are to be glorified in, in his presence, and the gifts of glory are both for the body and the soul. Three of these gifts pertain to the soul, and they are called vision, comprehension, and fruition, and four pertain to the body, clearness, impassibility, subtlety, and agility, and these are properly the effects of intuitive vision overflowing from the glory of the soul. In all these gifts, our Queen Mary participated to a certain extent already in this life, especially after the incarnation of the Word in her virginal womb. It is true that these gifts are given to the saints as comprehensors, being pledges and dowries of the eternal and imperishable felicity, and as it were, securities for the unchangeableness of their state. On that account they are not conferred upon those still on the way to heaven, but upon Holy Mary these gifts were conferred as a viator, hence not as 
on a comprehensor, nor permanently, but from time to time and step by step, and with a certain difference, as we shall explain, in order that the appropriateness of this rare blessing and that sovereign queen may be the better understood, let that which I have said in the seventh and following chapters before the Incarnation be remembered, for there the preparation and espousal with which the Most, Ho the most High favored his most blessed mother in accordance with her dignity are explained. On the day in which the Divine Lord assumed human nature in her virginal womb, this spiritual marriage, as far as the Heavenly Lady is concerned, was consummated by that most exalted and exquisite beatific vision, which, as we have said, was then vouchsafed to her. But for the other faithful, the Incarnation was, as it were, an espousal, which is to be consummated in their Heavenly Fatherland. O.C. 2.19 our great, our, sorry, our great queen possessed another prerequisite for these privileges. She was exempt from all stain of original and actual sin and was confirmed in grace by actual impeccability. Thus she was capable of celebrating this marriage in the name of the church militant and to make promises in the name of all its members. Ephesians 5.32 for in this matter, as she was the mother of the Savior, his foreseen merits found their application through her. But her transient vision of the glory of the divinity, by her transient vision of the glory of the divinity, she became the accepted surety for all the children of Adam. And this same reward will not be denied to any of those who shall use the grace of their Redeemer to merit it. The divine incarnate word certainly was highly pleased to find that his most burning love and his infinite merits should immediately bear fruit in her who at the same time was his mother, his first spouse in the bridal chamber of his divinity, and that his reward should fall upon one in whom there was no hindrance. By conferring these privileges and favors upon his most holy mother, Christ our, sa our salvation indulged and partly satiated his love for her and in her, for all the mortals. Too long a delay did it seem to the divine love to wait thirty-three years until he should manifest his divinity to his own mother. Although... He had shown her this favor at other times, as related in the first part. Yet, on this occasion of his incarnation, he did it in a more excellent manner, one which corresponded with the glory of his most holy soul. However, all this in her was not permanent, but renewed from moment to moment with the flow of time, in as far as was compatible with the ordinary state of pilgrimage. Conformably to this, God, on the day in which Most Holy Mary assumed the position of Mother of the Eternal Word by conceiving in Him in her womb, invested us with a right to our redemption, founded upon the espousal of the human nature with Himself. In the consummation of this spiritual marriage by the beatification of the Most Holy Mary and the conferring upon her the gifts of glory, the same reward was also promised to us if we should make ourselves worthy of it. Through the merits of His Most Holy Son, worthy of it through the merits of his most holy son our redeemer but so far did the lord raise his mother above all the glory of the saints and the blessings of it this day that all the angels and men even in their highest reaches of beatific vision and love cannot attain to that which the heavenly queen then attained the same must also be said of the gifts of glory which overflowed from the soul of her body to her body for all of them corresponded with her innocence, holiness, and merits, and these again correspond with the highest of all dignities possible to a creature, that of being the mother of her creator. Excuse me for one moment. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Out. Go outside. dog snoring was getting a little noisy over there. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Okay. Okay. Coming now to these gifts in particular, the first gift of her soul was the clear and beatific vision which corresponds to the obscure knowledge of faith in the Beatrice. I guess that's how you pronounce it. V-I-A-T-O-R-S. Beatrice. Beatrice. This vision was given to the Most Holy Mary at the times and in the manner already explained and to be explained later. 
Besides these intuitive visions, she had many other abstractive ones of the divinity of the kind mentioned above. Although all these were transient, yet they left in her mind most exquisite and various images, furnishing her with such a clear and exalted knowledge of the divinity that no words can be found to express it. In this Our Lady was singular, singularly privileged before all other creatures, and thus she possessed the permanent effects of the gifts of glory as far as is as compatible with her position as Viator. When at times the Lord hid himself from her, suspending the use of these images for certain high ends, she made use of infused faith, which in her was super excellent and most efficacious. In such manner, one way or the other, her soul never lost sight of that divine object, nor wandered from, from it even for a moment. However, during the nine months in which she bore in her womb the incarnate word, she enjoyed even greater visions and gifts of the divinity. The second of these gifts is comprehension, possession, or apprehension. This consists in the attainment of the end, corresponding to the virtue of hope, whereby we seek after the final object in order to possess it without danger of ever losing it. This possession and comprehension in Most Holy Mary corresponded to the visions mentioned, because seeing the divinity, she possessed it. Whenever she depended on faith alone, hope was in her more firm and secure than in any other creature, and in more than this, and in and more than this, for as the security of possession in the creature is founded to a great extent upon sanctity and impeccability, our heavenly lady on this account was so privileged that the firmness and security of her possession of God, although she was a pilgrim, equaled in certain respects the firmness and security of the blessed. For on account of her stainless and unimpeachable sanctity, she was assured of never losing God, although the cause of this security in her as Beatrix was not the same as the glorified saints. During the months of her pregnancy, she enjoyed this possession of God in various ways by special and wonderful graces, through which the Most High manifested himself and united himself to her most pure soul. The third gift is fruition, which corresponds to charity, since charity does not cease but is perfected in glory. 1 Corinthians 13.8 <clears throat> For fruition consists in loving the highest good possessed by us. This is the charity of heaven, that, just as God is known and possessed as he is in himself, so also he is loved for his own sake. True, even now, while we are yet viators, we love him for his own sake, but there is a great difference. Now we love him in desire, and we know him not as he is in himself, but as he is represented to us by incongruous images or by enigmas, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, John 3, 2. Therefore our love is not perfected, nor do we rest in it or find the plenitude of delight therein, though there, though there is much to incite us. But in the clear vision and possession we shall see him as he is in himself, and we shall see him through, the him, through himself, not through enigmas. Thus we shall love him as he should be loved and as far as we can love him respectively, our love will be perfected, and the fruition of him will be satiated without leaving anything to be desired. Most Holy Mary participated in this fruition more abundantly than any, in, in, in any other, for even though her most ardent love might, in a certain respect, have been inferior to that of the blessed whenever she was without the clear vision of the divinity, yet it was superior in many other points of excellence, even when, when, while remaining in the lower state. No one ever possessed the divine science in the same degree as this lady, and by it she understood how God is to be loved for himself. This science was perfected by the memory of what she had seen and enjoyed in higher in degree than the angels. And as her love was nourished by this knowledge of God, it necessarily exceeded that of the blessed in all that did not pertain to immediate fruition and unchangeableness as to increase or augmentation. On account of her profound humility, the Lord condescended to arrangement, whereby she could act as Beatrix, remaining in a holy fear of displeasing her beloved. This burning love was of the most perfect kind and tended entirely toward God himself. It caused in her ineffable joy and delight, proportioned to the excellence of her love. In regard to the gifts of the body, redounding from the gifts of glory, and other gifts of the soul, constituting the accidental part of the glory of the blessed, I will say that they serve for the perfection of the glorious bodies in the activity of their senses and motive powers. 
By them the bodies are assimilated to the soul and throw off the impediments of their earthly grossness, enabling them to obey the wishes of the souls, which in that most happy state cannot be imperfect or opposed to the will of God. The senses require two gifts, one to refine the reception of sensible images, and this is perfected by the gift of clearness, the other to repel all activity or passivity hurtful and destructive of the body, and this is done by the gift of impassibility. Two other gifts are required in order to perfect the power of motion, one in order to overcome the resistance or impediment of gravity furnished by the gift of agility, the other in order to overcome the resistance of other bodies furnished by the gift of subtlety. With these gifts the body becomes glorious, clear, incorruptible, agile, and subtle. Wow! In all these privileges our great queen and lady participated during her mortal life. The gift of clearness disposes the body to receive the light and at the same time to give it forth, doing away with earthly opaqueness and obscurity and making it more transparent than clear as crystal. Whenever Most Holy Mary enjoyed the clear and beatific vision, her virginal body participated in this privilege in a measure beyond all human calculation. The after-effects of this purity and clearness would have been most wonderful and astounding if they could have been made perceptible to the senses. Sometimes they were noticeable in her most beautiful face, as I will say later on, especially in the third part, yet they were not known or perceived by all who conversed with her, for the Lord interposed a, a curtain or veil in order that they might not always or indiscriminately be manifested. But in many respects she herself enjoyed the advantages of this gift, though it was disguised, suspended or hidden to the gaze of others. She, for instance, was not inconvenienced by earthly opaqueness as the rest of man. <coughs> men. St. Elizabeth perceived something of this clearness when at the sight of Mary she exclaimed, quote, And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Unquote. Luke 143. The world was not capable of perceiving the sacra this sacrament of the king. Tobias 12.7. Nor was it opportune to manifest it at that time. Yet to a certain extent her face was always more bright and lustrous than that of other creatures. Also, in other respects, it exhibited qualities altogether above the natural order of other bodies, which produced in her a most delicate and spiritualized complexion, like that of an animated crystal. This presented to the touch not the asperity natural to the flesh, but the softness, as it were, of the purest and the finest silk, so that I cannot find any other comparison to make myself understood. Yet at this, yet all this should not appear strange in the mother of God, for she bore him in her womb, and she had seen him often, even face to face. For the Israelites could not look upon Moses' face, nor bear the splendor which shone forth from him after his communication with the Lord upon the mountain. Exodus 34:29. Though it was much inferior to that vouchsafed to Most Holy Mary, there is no doubt that if God had not by a special providence withheld and hidden the withheld and hidden the splendor in reality due to the countenance and the body of his most pure mother it would have brightened the world more than a thousand suns combined none of the mortals could could by natural power have, have sustained its brilliancy since even thus restrained and concealed it was sufficient to cause in them the same effect which saint dionysus the aripagate aripagite experienced in looking upon her and which he describes in his letter to paul Impassibility produces in the glorified body such a condition that no agent except God himself can by any activity or influence change or disturb it, no matter how powerful this, this activity may be. Our queen participated in this gift in two ways. First, in regard to the temperament and humors of the body. She possessed these in such delicate measure and proportion that she could not contract or suffer any infirmities, nor was she subject to any other human hardships which arise from the from the inequality of the four humors, being in this regard, as it were, almost impassable. Secondly, in regard to this, to the dominion and commanding power which she had over all the creatures as mentioned above, for none of them had power to act contrary to her will and consent, we can add still another participation of impassibility, the assistance of the divine power in proportion to her innocence. For if it is said that the first parents in paradise could not suffer a violent death as long as they persevered in original justice, it must not be understood to mean that they enjoyed this privilege by intrinsic or inherent powers. For if a lance would have wounded them, 
they could die, but they enjoyed it through the assistance of the Lord, who would always prevent them from being wounded. If then the first parents possessed this privilege and could transmit it to their descendants as their servants and vassals, it was due by a much better title to the innocence of the sovereign Mary, and so in truth was she endowed with it. <clears throat> Our most humble queen made no use of these privileges, for she renounced them in imitation of her most holy son, and in order to labor and gain merits for our benefit. In spite of them, she wished to suffer, and she really suffered more than the martyrs. Human intellect cannot weigh correctly the greatness of these labors. We shall speak of them throughout this heavenly history, leave, leaving much more untold, for common language and words cannot encompass them. But I must advert to two things. First, that the sufferings of our queen bore no relation to any sins of her own, for she had none to atone for, and there, therefore she suffered none of the bitterness which is mixed with pains endured in the memory and consciousness of our own guilt of sins committed. Secondly, that in her sufferings she was divinely sustained in accordance with the ardors of her love, for she could not naturally endure so much sufferings as her love called for, or as much as, on account of this, love, this very love, the Lord allowed her to endure. I wondered about that before. Like, how did she, how did she endure that unimaginable pain? Subtlety is a gift which takes away from the glorified body the density or gro grossness natural to qual quantitative matter, and which enables it to penetrate other bodies and to occupy the same place with them. The subtilized bodies, subtilized bodies of the blessed, therefore, are endowed with qualities peculiar to the spirit and can without difficulty penetrate the quantitative matter of other bodies. Without dividing or separating them, it can occupy the same place. Thus, our Lord's body, coming forth from the grave, Matthew 28, 2, and entering the closed doors, John 20, 19, penetrated the material enclosing these places. Most Holy Mary participated in this gift not only while she enjoyed the beatific visions, but also otherwise, according to her will and desire, as happened many times in her life and her bodily appearances to some persons, of which we shall yet relate. For in all these she made use of her gift of subtlety, penetrating other bodies. The last gift of the body enables the glorified body to move from place to place instantly and without the impediment of terrene gravity in the in the manner of pure spirits which move by their own volition. Mary most holy possessed a continual and wonderful participation in this agility, especially as a direct result of the divine visions. She did not feel in her body the force or weight of gravity. Sorry. She did not feel in her body the force of weight and gravity. Therefore, she could walk without feeling the inconvenience usual to that kind of exercise. She could move about with instantaneous speed without feeling any shock or fatigue as we would feel. All this belonged naturally to the quality and condition of her body, so spiritualized and well-formed. During the time of her pregnancy, she felt even less the weight of her body, although in order to bear her share of labors, she allowed hardships to produce their effect. She was so admirable and perfect in the possession and use of these privileges that I find myself wanting in words to express all that has been made manifest to me concerning them, for it exceeds all, all that I have said or am able to say. Queen of Heaven and my Mistress, since thou hast condescended, condescended to adopt me as thy daughter, thy word will remain a pledge that thou wilt be my guide and teacher. Relying on this promise, I presume to propose a difficulty in which I find myself. How does it come, my mother and lady, that thy most blessed soul, after it had enjoyed the clear intuition of God according to the disposition of his majesty, did not remain in the state of blessedness? And why can we not say that thou didst remain in this state of beatitude, since there was no sin nor any other obstacle to this state in thee, according to the dignity and sanctity revealed to me by the supernatural light? Answer and explanation of our queen and lady. My dearest daughter, thou doubtest as one that loves me and asked as one not knowing. Consider then that the perpetuity and durability of blessedness and felicity is destined for the saints, since their happiness is to be entirely perfect. If it would last only for some time, it would be wanting in the completeness and adequacy necessary for constituting it as the highest and most perfect happiness. 
At the same time, it is in incompatible with the common law and ordinary course that the creature be glorified and at the same time be subject to sufferings, even though it be without sin. If this law did not hold good with my most holy son, John 1.18, it was because he was at the same time God and man, and it was not befitting that his most holy soul, being hypostatically united with the divinity, should be without the beatific vision, and as he was at the same time redeemer of the human race, he could not suffer nor pay the debt of sin, that is pain, if he had not possessed a body capable of suffering. But I was a mere creature, and therefore I could have no claim to the vision which to him was due as a god. Moreover, I could not be said to have permanently enjoyed the state of blessedness, because it was conceded to me from one time to another. Under these conditions I was capable of suffering at one time, and enjoying blessedness at another. Moreover, it was more usual for me to suffer and to gain merits than to be blessed, since I belong to the viators and not to the comprehensors. Justly, the Most High has ordained that the blessedness of eternal life should not be enjoyed in this mortal existence, Exodus 33.20, and that immortality should be reached by passing through existence in a mortal body and by gaining merits in a state of suffering, such as, such as is the present life of men, Romans 6.23. Although death in all the sons of Adam was the stipend and punishment of sin, Romans 6.23, and therefore the death and all the other effects and chastisements had no rights in me who had not sinned, yet the Most High ordained that I also, in imitation of my Most Holy Son, should enter into felicity and eternal life by the death of the, of the body, Luke 24.26. Therefore was nothing incongruous in this for me, but it afforded me many advantages, allowing me to follow the royal way of all men and gain many merits and great glory by suffering and dying. Another advantage resulted therefrom for, for men, for they saw that my most holy son and I myself, who was his mother, were truly human as they themselves, as they themselves since we proved to them our mortality. Thereby the example which we left them became much more efficacious than they would be induced to imitate and they would be induced to imitate the life which we led and would which redounded so much to the greater glory and exaltation of my son and lord and of myself. All this would have come to naught if the visions of the divinity had been continuous in me. However, after I conceived the eternal word, the benefits and favors were more frequent and greater since I was then brought into close connection with him. This is my answer to thy questions. No matter how much thou hast meditated and labored in manifesting the privileges and their effects enjoyed by me in mortal life, thou wilt never be able to comprehend all that the powerful arm of the omnipotent wrought in me, and much less canst thou describe in human words what thou hast understood. Now attend to the instruction which I will give thee regarding the preceding chapters. If I was the model to be imitated in the way I responded to the coming of God into the soul and into the world by showing due reverence, worship, humility, and thankful love, it follows that if thou, and in the same way the rest of the souls, art solicitous in imitating me, the Most High will come and produce the same effects in thee as in myself, though they may not be so great and efficacious. For if the creature, as soon as it obtains the use of reason, begins to advance toward the Lord as it should, directing its footsteps in the path of life and salvation, his most high majesty will issue forth to meet it, wisdom, 6.15, being beforehand with his favors and communications, for to him it seems a long time to wait for the end of the pilgrimage in order to manifest himself to his friends. Thus it happens that by means of faith, hope and charity, and by the worthy reception of the sacraments, many divine effects wrought by his condescension are communicated to the souls. Some are communicated according to the ordinary course of grace, and others according to a more supernatural and wonderful order, and each one will be more or less conformable to the disposition of the soul and to the ends intended by the Lord, which are not known at present. And if the souls do not place any obstacle on their part, he will be just as liberal with them as with those who dispose themselves, giving them a greater light and knowledge of his immutable being, and by a divine and exceedingly sweet infusion of grace, transforming them into likenesses of himself and communicating to them many of the privileges of the beatified. For after he is found, he allows himself to be taken possession of and enjoyed by that hidden embrace which the spouse felt when she said, quote, I will hold him and not dismiss him, unquote. 
Canticles 3, 4. Of this possession and of his presence, the Lord himself will give many tokens and pledges in order that the soul may possess him in peace like the blessed. Although always only for a limited time, so liberal as this will God, our Master and Lord, be in rewarding the objects of his love for the labors accepted by them for his sake and fearlessly undertaking to gain possession of him. In this sweet violence of love, the creature begins to withdraw from and die to all earthly things, and that is why love is called strong as death. From this death arises a new spiritual life which makes the soul capable of receiving new participations of the blessed and their gifts, for it enjoys more frequently the overshadowing of the Most High and the fruits of the highest good which it loves. These mysterious influences cause a sort of overflow into the interior and animal parts of the creature, producing a certain transparency and purifying it from the effects of the spiritual darknesses. It makes it courageous, as it were, indifferent to suffering, ready to meet and endure all that is adverse to the inclinations of the flesh. With a certain subtle thirst, it begins to seek after all the difficulty and violence incident to the attainment of the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 11:12. It becomes alert and unhindered by earthly grossness, so that many times the body itself begins to feel this lightness in regard to its own self. The labors which before seemed burdensome become easy. Of all these effects thou hast knowledge and experience, my daughter, and I have described and rehearsed them for thee, in order that thou mayest dispose thyself and labor so much the more earnestly, so that the divine activity and power of the Most High in working out his pleasure in thee may find thee well disposed and free from resistance and hindrance. Praise be Jesus Christ, our Lord. May God bless and keep you.